So today we have to talk about specifications for designing a mix. And I say we have to, because it can be a little boring talking about designing a mix and how people actually specify that stuff. So most of the time you have a civil engineer that's gonna actually go out and design that mix or design that, not the mix, design the actual specifications for the project. Um, that project um, a lot of times you'll be given and then you actually have to design your own concrete mixture. So you have to do engineering work to design that concrete mix. So one very, very, very common thing that I get from people is where do those numbers come from? Where do we get 3000 PSI? Where do we get, you know, this water cement ratio? Why do we have to use this much fly ash or this much uh, slag or, or something. Why do we have to do this ASR testing? And so I'm gonna try to communicate the best I can, but specifications can be really boring. Like I'm talking up there with the aggregates, okay, in our class, and they can be pretty boring. So I'll start off with this question. Is this quality concrete? Well, I don't know. It looks like a pavement looks Looks like they're doing stuff right in the construction process, but you know, is it, is it meet the strengths? Does it meet the durability requirements? I mean, it work, meets the workability requirements because they placed it and they look happy. People have their hands in their pockets. So there's not a, lot of a bunch of finishers back here crying. So, you know, you know, you know, the workability requirements are met, but everything else, I don't know. Maybe let's test the concrete. But after we test the concrete, you know, we test for, you know, maybe air and compressive strength. And well, you know, what do we compare those standards? You know, what do we compare those tests to? We have to compare them to a standard. So how do we get those standards? Well, you get them off your, your job site, um, the, the drawings that are on there. Well, how do we get up with those? How do, how do people come up with those numbers? Um, you know, that's kind of the, the question that we're going to answer today. And I'll go through some examples and kind of talk about the process. The process is important to understand. But first of all, people in general, um, they don't always understand what specifications are or guidelines or practices. So specification, that is like a job site requirement. So for this project, this is what's required. That's called a specification. A, a guide is, you know, a way to, to, to do something. So there may be some recommended guidelines, like, hey, we should, you know, the engineer may say, hey, you should, uh, you know, I'd recommend you following these practices or these guidelines. It's a way of doing something. You don't necessarily, you're not required to do it, but there's a reason why they said, you know, hey, I su suggest you to follow these guidelines whenever, um, you know, to build this concrete structure. Tolerance is how far out you can be by the, the, the spec. So you may have a target here, it's how far you can be either way or, you know, up or down. Um, so there's always, you know, things like as basic as rebar, putting reinforcement still together, tying it. Well, how far can they actually move? Up and down, side to side, how far can they really be out? It's hard to put rebar, you know, perfectly together, um, you know, within a 32nd of an inch, um, you know, right there. So, I mean, you're going to be a little bit out. How much is, you know, too much? It's the same thing with specifications. You know, you may have 3,000 PSI concrete. Well, do we meet 3,000 PSI concrete? You know, how far do we, 
you know, what's, what's kind of, you know, where are we at? Um, you know, same thing with air. You know, do you have to meet right there at 5% air or do you have a plus or minus? Obviously with strength, it is a minimum strength requirement. There's not a target and then, you know, plus or minus. It is, this is it. So you have to design over that and then have your window. Um, with air, you know, there's just a target. You just add enough air, air entrainment to, to hit whatever target you're looking for. Should also state when people start putting out codes, a lot of times they do really dumb things where they will um, forget numbers or they'll forget numbers or forget uh, words, they'll forget certain sentences. They do a lot of copying and pasting, especially private design firms. What they'll do is, you know, you have a, an intern so right after you get your, your, your civil engineering degree, you, you take your FE and you pass it, you become an intern, you work for a design engineer for at least four years, some of the PE. Well, that PE has all these different, you know, these standards, they're all copied that, that their company has, you know, written over the years. So what that, that PE and, and even the intern, what they'll do, a lot of times they'll just copy and paste the, um, the drawings from one, from one uh, project to another, and then they'll just tweak it. Well, sometimes those tweaks, they forget to, to, to look for everything. So you find dumb things like, you know, where the specification is just clearly, you know, missing words, or you say you can use fly ash, but then you can't use fly ash, and it's like, well, which one is it? Um, or they may state, you know, you need to follow this ACI. And it's like, well, that's not even a committee. There's no such thing as that committee. So, you know, what are you talking about? Um, and that's, you know, you might say that sounds kind of goofy, but it happens all the time. And so that's why sometimes, you know, people, they don't always go back and they, they, get, they get too big in a hurry because they're all about producing drawings, um, you know, as quick as possible um, to produce a product, a design. And so it's our job to take that, those drawings and we're looking at them to figure out what they actually mean, figure out what those specifications are saying, see if there is a problem, a conflict of interest, things that aren't, you know, always common. Um, Typically, there's going to be material um, information, things like you need to kind of understand um, for your location what your available cements are and your fly ashes and your slags and silica fume, like whatever is available for your cementitious. Um, you know, the admixtures that are available for that ready mix producer. If you are the ready mix producer, you should know that. And then you need to get the aggregate information too. Um, these are all you know, requirements of just doing a basic mix design. You need to have this. Um, so whenever we go through and we design mixes, this will be information that, that, I, that I'll give you. And you should have seen this, you know, this should be green in your memory almost, where there's this table and it has all the material specifications. And we've went through, you know, we went through and we looked at some of these um, C-494, um, C-33. I mean, some of these you should, you should see and you should go, okay, yeah, I remember this. I remember that, yep. Um, C-150, Portland Cement. So those are the materials, the, the material requirements. So this is all the different materials you can use to to come up with your mix design uh, because it's a certain standard quality. And then when we talk about the actual concrete mixture design, there are different um, guidelines out there. Right now, concrete durability doesn't have a specification out, but you know, there's these different guidelines. 
Um, and, you know, depending on what you're doing, it's hot and cold weather concrete, there's some really good guidelines out there to make sure you don't uh, mess up real bad. Um, evaluating strength results can really help you out to understand your, you know, how to get paid on your compressor strengths better or um, proportioning 211, proportioning concrete mixtures. There's a lot of documents that aren't just the one that is for designing uh, a typical concrete mix, but they have a lot of good, a good uh, stuff out there. The one for 211, the big one that we're, we're doing here is, is uh, older than everybody in this class. So, um, but they, they have like 15 other documents. So there's a lot of other documents that are, that are really good. So um, these are just different committees. So different experts and um, we'll sit on these committees and then we'll write up um, documents relating to these topics. We also have structural designs. So, uh, you know, 117 is your tolerances for pretty much anything dealing with concrete materials. Um, you also have the standard specifications for structural concrete. Um, so both of these are pretty much part of the universal building code too. So just kind of be aware they reference uh, people all around the world will actually use these codes. There's other codes that maybe there aren't structural concrete or like slabs on ground. So like floor slabs um, or maybe parking lots. But there are codes out there how to structurally design um, the concrete. And so how to structurally design the concrete is actually where most of your specifications for strength, durability come from. So um, things like, well, how much air, how did you figure out you needed 6% air? How did the design engineer figure out you needed a water cement ratio of this and a strength of this? Well, that's kind of what that all goes through. So if you remember from last lecture, I talked about the laws of mixed design. This is kind of a way that I've always been able to kind of communicate it. And really these are five really important behaviors, performance criteria for concrete. It's really hard to necessarily for engineers to put a, um, how to design for cost. I mean, you put it, it's, with, it's within your design, but it's not your actual, um, you know, it, it's not something that, you can actually, um, it's something you do kind of at, during the process and it touches on it. Same thing with serviceability, it's really hard to, um, to, to do that, but you can design for strength, you can design for workability, you can design for durability. And so that's kind of the three we're gonna hit on, these three, strength, workability, and durability. So almost talk, um, so, the design specifications for strength usually is going to be compressive strength. For pavement, you may also see flexural strength. Uh, durability, you may have something like air content, water cement ratio, um, a secondary cementitious material replacement. So you may have 25 or 30 percent flash replacement. You may also have like, you know, this needs to be ASR tested according to this, you know, uh, 1260, you also may have a cement type requirement. So you may not just be able to use just general type one cement, you may have to use type two cement. Um, and then workability, you know, kind of one of those that, since the design engineer doesn't actually um, you know, place the concrete, finish the concrete. It's hard for that person to really design for workability, but they try. They do try. They just, they're not concrete finishers. That is, you know, it's not something they're strong at. But it's communicated through slump. So, you know, they may have throw out some general numbers uh, based on application. So, like I've talked about in the past, if you are for doing a slip form paver, 
you may have a one inch slump. For a bridge deck where you're actually pumping the concrete, you may need a five inch slump. Um, for precast operation, where you want self consolidating concrete, you may have, you may not, you know, you may, there may be, you know, well above 10 inch slump. So you may actually use a slump flow instead and actually look, turn the cone over, fill it up inverted, pull it, and it's, and it's actually a spread. So there's a certain minimum spread that the concrete has to go and then measure the diameter. We'll talk about that in a couple lectures from now when we did concrete testing. But there's a lot of different slump, you know, kind of measure for slump. And like I said, engineers have huge um, difficulties with it. They're just, they're, they're not, you know, they haven't went out a lot of times and they weren't finishers. They weren't people that, you know, built a lot of this by hand. And they really don't know, um, you know, how you may, how you may go out and you have your construction company, how you prefer to get things placed may be different than how you want your concrete construction company to place that exact same application. So there is some, you know, variances on even contractor to contractor, how they want stuff done. Especially when we get into like floor slabs um, is a kind of a big one. But this is kind of a, a range of flowability. So this is whenever you're at, you know, you have a slump cone that's 12 inches. This is whenever you're out there at 12 inches, which is almost an imaginary number because your concrete has to be a certain thickness. So um, over there is zero. That's kind of, you know, when we look at different workability applications, self-consolidating concrete, where it's just like liquid, all the way to um, um, RCC, so roller compacted concrete, pervious concrete, like looks like just a bunch of rocks and looks really ugly um, when it's not being placed. Uh, slip form paver, because you know where it actually has starts to have slight flow to it. So that we'll kind of put out with either a target or a range of slump values. Um, either one works. So it may be, you know, five inches plus or minus an inch, or it could be four to six inches. Um, and they may even say something like, depending on um, application. So that, so if you're designing the mix and you know the person actually going to go out and place the concrete, you may ask them, hey, what are you going to place the concrete? Um, and that can kind of help out. So you may design the mix for, um, the typical, the typical uh, concrete mix, typical placement you think is going to happen if you're going to go and submit a job. Um, and then you can come back and maybe they want it more flowable so you can use a mid-range water reducer to get you the workability you want. So just kind of be aware. So ACI 318 is uh, the building code for structural concrete. It's been uh, been there for years and years and years. It's what, um, whenever you are, whenever you are a civil engineer and they're designing, they can literally give, you have to buy your book, that's your textbook for the class. So you go through quite a bit of uh, the actual design process and your structures to class here, you actually talk like half some of it's about steel design and some of it's about reinforced concrete design. So you get into the reinforced concrete design then. Um, but in, within this code, they're really restructuring a lot of it, but um, chapter 19 and, and 26, they kind of have most of the stuff that we care about when we're talking about concrete mixture designs and the specifications that lead up to those. Um, so also 301 has quite a bit of, of information too in different chapters, uh, especially chapter, I think it's four or five. Um, and they're actually taking things from 318 and putting it in 301 because um, just because of uh, um, to make it more universal for all the different concrete codes. So 
when we design compressive strength, so how do you get 3,000 PSI or 3,500 or 4,000 on a job? Well, there's different, different reasons how you get there. So in general, no concrete is supposed to be lower than 2,500 PSI, unless it's something like flowable fill or, or something like that. Concrete in general, you're going to see a standard of 3,000, just general. That's as low as you, that's as low as you want to go um, for a minimum compressive strength requirement. And then you also have the durability design requirements on top of that. So you may, as you get higher in strengths, you're going to get more and more durable because your concrete's stronger and it can relax, uh, it can, um, it can um, resist some of those issues better. You also have structural requirements. So when the design engineer goes in and figures out um, for these loads that they're putting on it, um, how well that it's, this concrete's going to bend and how where it's going to, you know, shear in the moment uh, when they're looking at that and how much it's actually going to deflect that concrete. They're going to come up with a certain requirement. Um, and, it, and it's very lengthy on how that's done, but they'll have a minimum compressive strength that they need just for structural purposes. Typically, it's going to be based on a 28 day number. So 3000 PSI compressive strength at 28 days. Probably at least 60% of all concrete is, um, is between 3000 and 5000 PSI um, at 28 days is the specification. As you start getting into more and more about strength, highly suggest ACI 214 can really help out. So how we design for strength is you're going to take that minimum compressive strength that that design engineer is going to say. So we may say 3000 PSI. So that's a minimum. You're going to go in and you're going to design with a safety factor. So you're going to try to figure out, okay, so how much more do I need to be than that 3000 PSI? And you're going to adjust it to your mixture. So you're going to use that adjusted, you know, uh, compressive strength for your mixture. You're going to design your mix and then you may readjust. So you may did your trial batch and you say, oh, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm still a little low on compressive strength. So you may have to change up the principles, you know, water cement ratio um, to get there. So like I said, you have a minimum specified F prime C. So it might say the design engineer might say he needs 3000 PSI for the durability, you know, for all these different parameters that go behind there. You need to come in and design it with an adjusted, um, adjusted design. So, you know, you may be at 3800 for that adjusted design, just so that, you know, most of your uh, cylinder brakes are well above 3000 PSI. Um, I should note that ACI 301 and 318 allow for a certain minimum amount of cylinders to be under that 3000 PSI mark. Um, most of the time this is going to be based off of, we're going to talk about how you get the safety factor. Um, two standard deviations is pretty common. So that gets you within your 95% uh, interval. But we're going to talk a little bit about how you get that the standard deviation here in a minute. But it's almost impossible to never get a low break. Like I said, you could have 10,000 cylinders. Um, you could design them at 6,000, 10,000. It doesn't matter what that number is. Eventually, if you break enough cylinders, you will get a very, you'll eventually get a low break. It's well lower than that 3000. So they recognize that and they say, hey, look, this is, you know, this is where you're going to be okay. So, like I said, if it's going to have required design strength, so what does that mean? So you have a minimum design strength 
talked about here, minimum specified. Then you have your adjusted design. So really this is the adjusted design strength is what we're gonna talk about. So if it's less than three, less than 5,000 PSI, then you have these two equations you have to run through to in essence get your compre minimum compressive strength value plus um, that safety factor. That's what this is all about. So if it's 3,000 PSI, it's 3,000 plus a safety factor. So it may be 500, it may be 800. And so what they do is they say you need to, we've done a lot of testing and we have found out that these equations work really good to give you those standard deviations. So if you have um, more than <clears throat> so you'll have to go through <clears throat> and look at if it's 5,000 less than 5,000 you run through these two equations um, but you but your but how much historical data um, is really important to get this standard deviation so the standard deviation number, you know, you're only as good, if I break one cylinder, just one, what does that mean? I have one data point, right? Mm -hmm. If you have 30 data points, you have a lot better understanding of what standard deviation is. You break three data points, you know, it's better than one, but it really doesn't tell you as much. And so the, what they require is if you have 30 or more, then what they're saying is, is they have a modification factor and they want you to modify it based on how many um, tests you have for your, that comes up with your standard deviation. So that S, and so you actually have a factor that goes into it to that S number before you can even run this calc. So if you have 30 or more, it's just one, that's great. But if you have less than 15, you know, if you have 15 or less, um, you have to use this other table. So for example, if you have 30, if you have say 15 um, results with a 250 PSI, <clears throat> then you can do your calculation so 1.16 times 250 would be your um, equals uh, 290. So that would be your adjusted um, standard deviation. And then you could run through and take, so you have two different equations since it's 3000 PSI, you have two different equations you can use. Again, less than 3000 PSI, I'm talking about these two equations up here. I split them up and ran, did the math. So 3,000 plus your standard deviation is 3,290 PSI. And then I did this, ran through this equation here the same way um, and came up with 3,167. And you always pick the highest. So I picked the higher one. So that would be if you had a really low standard deviation. Now, a lot of times you're gonna have a higher standard deviation. So you may be at 37, 3,800. So they did the 290, but they didn't, it looks like it didn't multiply by the 134. So they just take the S and just put oh, it in there? Nope, I just typed it in wrong. I need to, it'd be that 130, you're right. Okay. Times one, uh, 1.3. I was just wondering, you were like, so that's, that's great. Which would be So 3,000 times 
1.34. So obviously it's still going to be a higher number. Go. And then what you're going to do is you may go through here. So after you get your um, 3,389, you're like, okay, so what do I do now? You may have a water to cement ratio strength relationship that you can have. So this is pretty common for when we do mixed designs. This is kind of like the standard table uh, but for, every, for your mix, you can actually develop your own uh, table or develop your own three-point curve to figure out for non-air and trained and air and trained concrete. You can actually go through and interpolate to figure out what your water cement ratio is. So if it's, let's say it's non-air and trained and it's, uh, you know, you know that your number is going to be in the middle between these. So you can go through and interpolate um, how to how to actually calculate that. So if your number was three thousand three hundred eighty nine, you go through and you know that you're going to be um, you may be at you know point six zero. So you'd have to go through and actually calculate that number. If you have no historical data whatsoever, so if you're we talked about our S. We said, remember, use table two. Well, this is table two. So if you have no historical data whatsoever, you need to, um, you actually need to go in and uh, um, use this table. So what they do, as opposed to saying 3000 PSI plus a standard deviation, and that standard deviation is modified. Uh, you know, when we look at other uh, test data, this one just throws in and goes, hey, you're at 3,000, you need to be at least 1,200 PSI above 3,000. So you may need to be at 4,200 PSI. You have no data, that's a really good um, number to be at, is what they recommend. You're over 5,000, then you actually have an equation. So 10%. You add 10% to your F prime C number, and then you add another 700 PSI. That's how they get there. So what I did was, is I actually did all that math and I put it in this table. So you can actually look for 3,000 PSI, and you'd be 4,200, you'd be say 6,000. Um, when you go through the 1.1 times 6,000 plus 700, that gives you that number. So um, that's just kind of what I did by hand uh, in one of my books I'm writing. So that kind of helps you out quite a bit. I'll show you the actual real tables, some of these real tables um, they have, and you go, oh my gosh. I'm like, yeah, they're, like I said, they're, they were made, the book was published in 1990 for 211 mixed design. So it's pretty rough, but it's, the best that they have out. And I just mean in general. So how does this work when you have zero um, historical data? Like I showed you, it's 3000 PSI. You're here, you just add 1200 to that number and, and you get there. So again, if you're trying to figure out your water cement ratio of your concrete from your, to get your strength right on your mix, then you're going to interpolate um, between these numbers to figure out your water cement ratio. So since you're at 4,200, you know you're gonna be you know, maybe at 0.55. So you might say, hold on a second, hold on. So why are we using water cement ratio? Why, why'd you bring that table up? Well, when you're designing a concrete mix, you want to figure out, um, you want to design it based off strength. So we talked about the 
the minimum, you know, compression strength, say 3000 PSI, you may need to be, if you have no historical data, you may be at 4200. Okay, well, you take that 4200 number, and that's actually what you design your, your strengths with. So that you have, so that you have a good safety factor, so you're well above that 3000 mark. Water cement ratio is the number one way to control your strength. So how much water do you have in your mix divided by how much cement and fly ash and slag and everything else, how much of that great, how much of that powder do you have in there? And that will affect your strength. So that's kind of what we're doing here. So let's switch gears. This shows you how, to, how people design for strength. You'll actually have to do some of that um, because the design engineer is only going to give you, say, 3,000 PSI, and you're, you're going to have to figure out um, how much of a safety factor you're going to have to have to design your mix. Um, so when we talk about designing for durability now, so how do you get 6% air? How do you know that your water cement ratio um, needs to be this? Because for strength issues, it may, you know, it can may, you know, for 3000 PSI, you don't have to be at a 0 0.40 water cement ratio, um, like I showed, you know, here, you know, I mean, we're not making 6000 PSI, we don't have to be way up here at an early low water cement ratio, we're down here. And so, you know, why, why did the design engineer do that? Well, that's what we're going to talk about. So for exposure, free stall durability, sulfates, chlorides, water. If we do ASR, they may just make you do testing for ASR and to make sure, you know, for that test, you're below a certain number. Um, but right now, how, how, it's, how it's done, you got this gigantic, ugly table here. And they have exposure. So they have free stall. So F1 or F0 to F3, that's for free stall. F means free stall. And so if you have almost no exposure, two, three is, a, is like a severe exposure case. S is for sulfates. So if you see here, you see this S. That's actually for your sulfates. You have your water which is only two categories. So if you have structures that are in water or not in water, then you have your chlorides. So um, depending on how much, you know, people are going to salt their bridges up north or, you know, are you in seawater? You, you may, you know, there's chlorides in, in seawater. So um, you have to design for that. So you might go, okay. Well, how does that mean that's a gigantic table? So let's let's do through, go through an example. So if we use ACI for, for durability, we have a bridge deck in Indiana. What the design engineer is going to do is they're going to say, okay, well, my exposures for free stall in Indiana in this area, they're going to make these up. They're going to have F2. They may think that the sulfates is a S1. They may say, okay, it's not water. They may have a chloride, you can't see it, but a C2, which is right down there. So you might say, okay, so exposure, they, they assign that. Then they have a maximum water cement ratio for, the, for each of those exposure categories. They also have a minimum compression strength. F prime C is compressive strength. Then they also have for their cementitious materials. So right here, it's how much um, they don't just have maybe type one cement. They may say, oh, you have to use a type two or a type five, or you know, you may need to use a type five with or type uh, four or type two with with uh, SCMs. So some of this is kind of, you know, kind of put it here. And so these two here is actually a note 
where it says you can use type two with SCMs and test them. We kind of change it to make both of these that way because type five is not really made anymore. Um, so you have this ugly table. And what they'll do is each of them, each of these different classes have a maximum water cement ratio that they, that they, that they have. So, and they have a minimum compressor strength. So you may come through and then air too. So you may come through, really air is only for F, 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 F uh, two. But what I did was I took out those numbers that they picked, put them in a table. So that you saw the arrow of the F2, I just made this a very simple table, combined everything together for this one example problem. So Indiana bridge deck, your F2 um, requirement, you have a you know, requirement for your water cement, pressure strength in your air, sulfate, chlorides, and water. So you can go through and you can pick out the biggest. So this is the only air spec, but if it was, you know, if there was more, then you pick out the biggest. You pick out the lowest water cement ratio, and you pick out the highest compressive strength. And that's what the design engineer comes up with. So whenever we go through our mixes and we say the mix design, you know, has a 0.4 water cement ratio, they may have got it from this table, maybe because of uh, it's how they did it. Okay, that's how they get their strengths and, and their air and stuff. So I got one more example. So. ACI 318 is great for private sector work, but Dr. Cook, what about transportation work? So, well, so, you know, I've, I don't know how many times I've gotten a phone call from somebody going, call me up, they go, Dr. Cook, can you design me a mix, you know, for, for this DOT? So in this case, Oklahoma DOT, it's a, I'm doing a slip form paving concrete mix. Um, can you help me out here? And I go, sure. So when I design stuff, I always say, well, what's your specs? Well, they said it was Oklahoma Department of Transportation. Every transportation has their own specs. In their area, how they do business, the materials they know, the issues they have in their areas how they make good concrete, how they make good asphalt, how they have good aggregate base is all in a construction manual for specifications. So every 10 years they come out with new ones. This is um, uh, 2019, they just came out in January of 2020. A lot of your cities and your counties will use this too. And we can click on the link to go to it. But in essence, the standards, if I go out and I take out the tables that you actually need to design your mix um, for pavement. So pavement is a, is a single A mix. We can look at the, read the descriptions if you really wanted to. But whenever you do, this is actually, I believe, pretty close to the table they have. They have a minimum cement content. They have an air target and range. And they have a slump, plus or minus. And so they also have a water cement ratio and a minimum compressor strength. This is another table they have. So you pull out those, you, and again, this is a large spec book. So, you know, I'm pulling out quite a bit of information, but you have to find those tables in there. And you realize, okay, we're dealing with a class A mix, 3000 PSI compressor strength, 0.48 water cement ratio, uh, cementitious of of 564 pounds, the air content of, of six, and a slump of two. Now I'm probably going to design for a one inch slump or an inch and a half, um, but just because it's going to be a slip form paver, so you want something that's stiff, you don't want something that's like a three inch slump, um, but that's kind of how they do it. So whenever we're in class, we come back and we do 211, um, and we go through this, this is how, that's how we kind of get some of those numbers. Um, does that make sense? You have questions. Um, I know 
we're about out of time, but anybody have any questions? Okay, well, if you do, I'll be here for a little bit, so. It will be soon. That's the good thing about having exams. You gotta, you gotta break from everything. I know. I was like, man, my weekend was so light because I didn't have to hold for it. Any homework? Any problem?